speaking to you this morning, uh, dear friends, on the new birth, and ask you the question, have you been born again? Have you been born again? One of the most challenging verses in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 which exhorts us to examine ourselves whether ye be in the faith prove your own selves know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates it's a tough verse isn't it he said something very similar in relation to the partaking of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11 Verse 27, where it says that uh, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. I want us to do that today. To truly examine ourselves, whether we are in the faith. You see, many people are deceived about the true condition or state of their souls before God. It seems to me in different church traditions there are different dangers of this. Um, in some traditions the great danger is to confuse the ordinance of water baptism with the true operation of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. I have to say in our circles that is not our danger. But we do have a danger in the reformed world, if you like. It seems to me the pitfall that we can so often so easily fall in in the reformed tradition is to confuse an intellectual and even a deep knowledge of divine truth and adherence to creeds as sufficient without the renewal of the heart and life that comes from the new birth. You see, we become a Christian not through a new brain, but through a new heart. How else do we explain the deadness, one might almost say the irrelevancy, of most reformed churches in our country today. You see, knowledge of divine truth without the quickening of the Holy Spirit in new birth produces nothing. And so, dear friends, be we ever so sound in our Calvinism, we are no better off than the Papist or the Charismatic if we've never received the true new birth. And we, like many of them, will hear the awful words, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, it seems to me that when you read the New Testament, and particularly in the Acts of the Apostles, we read of believers who were filled with the life of God. They were newborn children with the life of God flowing through them. That's what we read of. And the great danger always, and one which the Apostle Paul constantly had to fight against, is our tendency to fall back into legalism. To see the Christian life not as merely a lifestyle that we've been left to imitate. But to be born again is to receive the actual life of God within us. The Apostle Paul saw the life of a Christian as someone in this way. He described it in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10. Always bearing about in the body 
the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That's a Christian. Someone in, through, in and through whom whose body the life of Jesus is manifest. And so, this morning I want to ask you, do you, do you know anything of that? I don't know if you have ever had the experience of uh, having a, a friend who you and everyone else thought was a Christian. They even spoke of their faith, they even shared their faith. Exhorted others to believe in what they said they believed and yet they wandered away from the faith. They no longer call themselves a Christian. And, and this confuses us because we, we believe rightly that if you're truly saved you can never lose your salvation. And yet we were so convinced that this person was a true believer but now they're, they're gone from us. They no longer believe. There was a young, a young Scottish Puritan called Henry Scougal. He was a professor of divinity at Aberdeen University. And he had this exact experience. A friend who had left the faith. And he wrote a very long letter to this friend. And this long letter became a Puritan classic called the life of God in the soul of man. You can buy it from Amazon if you want. But you see, that title, dear friends, is the essence of what the scriptures say about the new birth. It is the life of God in the soul of a man or a woman. There's no substitute for this. And if you have that, it is true, you can never lose it. But you have to have it in the first place. Less than a hundred miles from here was born one of the most famous, famous evangelists this country has ever produced, George Whitfield. He was used to uh, spread the gospel throughout Britain, Europe, and perhaps more than any other country, the United States of America, in the 18th century. And like most evangelists, he only had a set of sermons, he didn't write a sermon, a new sermon for every meeting, it would be impossible. He, he polished them up and improved them. but. He had one sermon which was known as his signature sermon. He first preached it in St. Mary's in Bristol. And the title of this sermon was called The Nature and Necessity of Our New Birth in Christ Jesus in Order to Salvation. The nature and necessity of our new birth in Christ Jesus in order to salvation. He preached that hundreds and thousands of times all around the world. And Whitfield and the Wesleys, unlike most of their Anglican colleagues, <clears throat> did not believe that Christianity was all about church ordinances attendance, moralism. Methodism then taught that there had to be a spiritual transformation of the heart through new birth. And so dear friend, I'm going back to what I said at the beginning, I want us to be honest with ourselves this morning. As I very briefly, very quickly, just walk through some of the scriptures on this. I 
want you to ask yourself, is this my experience? Have I been born again? Do I know this in my life? I'm not asking you if you believe in the five points of Calvinism. It's better that we do, but it won't get you into heaven. I'm asking, is the life of God in your soul? Because that's what being a Christian is. Have you been born again, born anew, born from above? Have you had a, a, you obviously have had a natural birth by natural generation, but have you had a heavenly birth? Have you been born again? Let's turn first to John chapter 1 and verse 11 and to 13 where it says, he, that's Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, came unto his own, and his, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are here in the prologue to John's Gospel and in these verses he summarises the points of teaching that he will expand on later in his Gospel. But what these verses teach us is that in order to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you first of all have to be born again. Verse 11, many, most didn't believe him. Jesus came into his own people. <coughs> Most did not receive him, but verse 12, some did. Some do. Some believe on the name of Jesus. And that's what you have to do to become a Christian. You have to believe on the name of Jesus. You have to believe he is the Son of God. That was the only qualification that the evangelist Philip Required from the Ethiopian unit, wasn't it? Was it to, to be baptized? He didn't have, have to have a degree in theology. He just had to believe. He said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's all you have to do to be a Christian. But how did you get to that? John. That's from our perspective, isn't it? We believe in Jesus, but behind that belief, John is teaching here, there is the greatest miracle of all. John teaches here and elsewhere that enabling this belief on the part of man lies a great divine action of God called the new birth. In these three verses I read, we have two positive things stated and three negative things stated. The two positive things are, verse 12, that those who receive Christ, who have believed on his name, have been given power to become the sons of God. You see, to become a Christian, those of us who have become Christians, we were given the power to believe. And then in verse 13, those who received Christ and believed on his name were born of God. You have to be born of God in order to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read three negative statements. First of all, in verse 13, which were born not of blood, firstly, nor of the will of the flesh, secondly, and thirdly, nor of the will of man. Not of blood. Mm. So we're not saved as a result of our family or our ancestry, if you like. We're not born again because of our Christian heritage. You're not a Christian because your parents were. 
And contrary, contrary to some teaching, there's no guarantee that your children will become a Christian, no matter how godly you bring them up. It's more likely, you could argue, but it's not a formula that it is always the case. Because it's not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, it says. Being born again is not a matter of willpower. It's not a matter of pulling yourself up, as it were, to God, to trying to improve yourself through means of self-improvement. It's not through ritual or routine or even religion. Many people think it is. It's not of the will of the flesh. Nor is it, lastly, of the will of man, John says. To be born again is not man's initiative. It's not of the will of man. To be born of God is God's action. In other words, it's not something within the realm of our initiative. But to those who are born of God, power is given to believe and they become a son of God. It's a wonderful thing to think. The new birth, John teaches here, is a sovereign act of God's power in which we are born and given the gifts of repentance and faith to believe. And so I ask you again, are you born again? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been given the power to become a son of God? Turn to John chapter 3, the reading that we had a little earlier. John chapter 3, we're introduced here in this chapter to, you might say, a case example, the supreme example of the new birth. We're introduced to a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus was... Uh, one of the most distinguished teachers of Israel in his day. According to the historian, Jewish historian Josephus, there were around 6,000 Pharisees at the time, in the time of the Lord Jesus. And they were the strictest religious believers of all. Literally, the word Pharisee means to separate. They were separatists. They were separate from the things of the world and they devoted themselves to God. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee. But not only was he a Pharisee, he was a ruler of the Jews. You see, out of these roughly 6,000 Pharisees, 71 were chosen to become members of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the ruling body of Israel. And Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a master of the Torah. He says that in verse 10. He would have memorized the uh, first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and no one would have known the Bible better than Nicodemus. It wasn't a matter of his Bible knowledge. It wasn't a matter even of his theology in many ways. He would have been the evangelical wing of Jewish belief. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in the Bible. They weren't like the Sadduc Sadducees, who were not the liberals of uh, today. Well, there are many liberals left, uh, I don't think. But there was something missing in Nicodemus. He knew it. He knew the Bible, but under cover of darkness he comes to Jesus and he pays the greatest respect to Jesus. He calls him, calls him a rabbi. He acknowledges his miracles. He has great respect and admiration. A very high view of Jesus. Great admiration for 
the teaching of Jesus. There's another lesson there, dear friends, by the way. It's not enough to have a very high view of Christ. Nor is it enough to be fixated, if you like, with the miraculous. Even the miracles of Jesus is not enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, many, many today have a high view of Christ, but it's not enough. Mahatma Gandhi, the, uh, that Indian lawyer who led the campaign for Indian independence from Britain, he said, Jesus to me is a great world teacher among others. He had a very high view of Jesus. Muslims have a very high view of Jesus. He's one of their major prophets. But it's not enough. Christ says to Nicodemus, this man who, who's come to him at night and is acknowledging Jesus' greatness, he's saying, he looks right through him, right into his heart. And in verse 3 he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He needed a spiritual birth from above. He says, it's not enough to know the Bible. It's not enough to be religious. It's not enough to admire Christ. Even to believe in his miracles. It's not enough. The healings aren't enough. It's not enough to separate yourself from the world. It's not even enough to devote your mind to, the, to God and to the law because the Pharisees did that. It's not enough to be like the Pharisees, to be even missionary minded. They would travel to the far ends of the earth to convert one person. But that wasn't enough either. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, You see, it's not enough because you have to be born by God, unto God, to see the kingdom of God. It's a great tragedy when someone is, as it were, an almost Christian. They know the lingo, they know the jargon, they, they pass off as a Christian, as it were. They even engage in Christian activities and yet they've never been born. They've never had a real birth. Because to, be, to see, Jesus says, the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus proves this almost immediately in verse 4 because he just doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You see, Nicodemus was still thinking carnally, physically. He couldn't see the kingdom of God. He couldn't understand that the real kingdom of God was the life of God in the soul of man. Nicodemus was still a natural man. He wasn't yet a new man. And he was blind to the things of the Spirit. And Paul had hit against this problem the whole time. We read of it more than once in the New Testament, where he was there trying to share spiritual things of the Gospel and of God, and people just couldn't get it. They couldn't see it. He said, uh, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And we find this all the time, don't we, when we try to explain Christian things to someone, even someone who accepts all the doctrine, happily signs up to the Nicene Creed, but they still don't really see it. There's no life there. And whatever you do, 
however you put it, they continue to think that the Christian life is about prayers and keeping holy days and tithes and all the external things. And that's where Nicodemus was. And in verse 5, Jesus again says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you need a new birth to experience the kingdom of God. In that verse 5, Jesus uses... Well, in verse 2 and 5 and verse 8, Jesus uses two metaphors or two symbols that are often used of the Holy Spirit in Scripture to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. In verse 5, he uses the symbol of water, and in verse 8, he uses the symbol of the wind. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Scripture is nearly always compared to water and wind, one or the other. Verse 5, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, what Jesus is saying is that to be mine, to be born again, you have to be washed. You have to be washed. You have to be washed with the Holy Spirit. That's necessary, my friend, because by nature we are defiled. We're dirty. And just like physical water washes dirt from the body, in the new birth, the living water of the Holy Spirit washes us from spiritual uncleanness. The new birth is a washing and a cleansing. That's why I read Ezekiel. You see, Jesus said once to Peter, well, Peter said to Jesus, I should say, you will never wash my feet, I'll never let you wash my feet. Let you wash my feet, Jesus. And Jesus says, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Peter said, My feet, not my feet only, Lord, but also my hands and my feet. You see, Jesus, unless he washes us, we cannot see, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. So when you're born again, you are washed and made pure. Paul teaches this in Titus 3 verse 5, where he talks of the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It was the great hope of the prophets, wasn't it? I read one of those prophecies earlier. And I'm sure that Jesus had this verse in mind when he spoke to Nicodemus. And Ezekiel said, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthy, filthiness, and from your idols will I cleanse you. In many other places, like Zechariah, God promised that in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. You see, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're washed. You have to be born of water under the Spirit. Not baptism, I'm not talking about water baptism, but a real experience of the Holy Spirit by which you are clean and given a new heart, that heart that Ezekiel spoke about. Have you ever had that, dear friend? Have you ever had that time in your life when God has taken your heart which is stony which is dirty he's taken it out 
And he's replaced it with a heart of flesh. And given you a new heart. A time in your life when you've literally, spiritually been born again. That's what Jesus says is the definition of being one of his children. And then Jesus uses another symbol in verse 8, the symbol of the wind. He says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. <coughs> Two things are clear from this. The work of the Spirit is invisible, like the wind. You can't see it. You can't see the wind. But you can hear it. You hear the sound thereof. This was literally the case on the day of Pentecost when suddenly there came a sign from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting. You see the wind is invisible. The wind of the Holy Spirit upon a person's life is invisible but it's noticeable. You can hear it. It has an effect. It makes a noise. And so is everyone born of the Spirit, Jesus said. said. So my friend, if you say you're a Christian, if you say you're born again, are you having any effect? Because if the wind's blowing, it's going to be noticed. Does any sound come from you? Does the wind blow as it were? To be born again is to be filled, to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And one of the saddest and greatest evidences that many churchgoers are not born again is that their lives make absolutely no difference. That there's no sound coming from them. There's no evidence of the wind in the America, the United States of America apparently there are nearly 250 million people who claim to be Christians can you believe that? and do you think that even a quarter, even a tenth of that number were really born again that America would be like it is today? I don't believe so. You see, the wind blows and you hear the sound thereof. If you're born again, something happens. You see, it's time to get real about this, isn't it? That as Nicodemus had to do. It's all very well saying, well, yes, I'm a teacher of the law. I'm a sound Christian, I'm a sound church, I'm a sound Calvinist, but do you make any noise? Does it make any difference? Is the wind blowing? Because that's what Jesus said being born again is. The second thing we learn from this symbol of the wind is that the work of the Holy Spirit is a sovereign work of God. The wind blows where it listeth. You can't tell where it come, cometh and whither it goeth. You see, no man can control the wind. The new birth can't be organised. It can't be drummed up. It can't be advertised or arranged. It's invisible, it's mysterious, it's sovereign. And it occurs in the lives of sinners at the most unexpected and in the most unexpected people. You see, we turn to John 5 now, and verse 21. This sovereign, the sovereign nature of the new birth is emphasized here in the 21st verse. John 5, 
For it says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son of Man quickeneth whom he will. He quickeneth whom he will. The Lord Jesus, in other words, has divine authority to raise the dead, physically and spiritually. He has the power to shout out a man's name into a tomb and say, come out of that tomb and live. And he has the power to bring that dead man out of the tomb out of the darkness into the sunshine of a new day and give him a new life. That's what being born again is. And we need that because we're totally incapable of a new birth on our own. It's not of the will of the flesh. It's not of the will of man, it's not of the power of the flesh. A dead man can't rise from his own grave God has to raise him by the power of his name. There's only one who can raise the dead, dear friends. It's the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, Paul said, You hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Elsewhere in the Colossians he says, You being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your sins. You see, to be born again is to pass from death into life. Jesus says in the 25th verse of this chapter, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. That's true of the future, when he will raise the dead from their graves. But he says, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Jesus is raising dead people now. And he can raise you, dear friends. Has he ever spoken life into your life? You see, you must be born again. You need something miraculous, creative, and powerful. An act of the Holy Spirit in your life to be born anew. To be born from above. In the new birth, God implants his very own life in you. Eternal life. My friends, I'm going to close now because the time is gone. To become a Christian is to become a new creation, a new creature. It's more than just it's more than justification by faith. Justification by faith changes our legal status. It doesn't change us inside. We need to be born again. It's more than conversion. You can convert a van from petrol to LPG, but it's still your own work van. You need a new van. You need a new life. You need a new birth. It's more than conversion. It's being born anew. And I want to seriously ask you today, have you been born again? Have you ever experienced the life of God in your soul? That's what being, being a Christian is. It's what being a church is. A group of born again ones. Where the water, the wind is flowing and blowing and making a noise and making a difference. We can claim all sorts of things about ourselves, how, how, how correct we are, how, how sound we are, how much better we are than others. It makes no difference to God, and unfortunately it makes no difference to the world. It's only those churches that know the Holy Spirit's power and presence and ministry 
you make any difference whatsoever. And so let us earnestly pray that each one of us is in the faith, is truly a son of God. And together let us work for him, be a true and living temple for him in these days. Amen. Amen.